All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased that we have uh, Ron Paul joining us today. Now, this man, in my opinion, has done more to spread the message of personal liberty and peace than anyone in my lifetime. And so it's a real pleasure to have him on the show today. Thank you very much, Ron. Great. It's great to be with you. Now, before we get started, I would say you, know, you, you guys have had encounters many, many times over the decades. Uh, and, you know, Douglas, Doug, why don't you just go ahead and pick up where, where, where we started before we got on camera here. Well, it's true. Uh, Ron would often come to uh, meetings of the Aris Society in uh, Aspen, Colorado, when uh, that was going on. And, you know, whether it's there or most recently in Acapulco, uh, we've really not had a chance to sit down because everybody's always besieging Ron. Um, they, they all want to talk to him. They want to get an autograph. They want to do something. So you're a very hard man to have a conversation with, not because you're hard to have a conversation with, but because nobody lets you talk other than giving a speech. So that's what we hope to do today is just have a conversation, Ron. Oh, great. So where do we start? You know, what are the big questions? Well, some questions that might get things going, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, one because you are such, you know, you're the messenger of personal liberty, so much so, it's influenced my, changed my thinking. I just wonder what you make of, you know, the last 14 months or so, where it seems like personal liberty has been the greatest casualty of everything that's gone on. And I just, I just want your overall impressions of that and the kind of situation we find ourselves in today. You know, I think I think that's a, a tough one to sort out because I, I want to be the optimist. I generally am. I think progress has occurred thousands of years and things seem to get better. Standard of living seems to be going up for a lot of people. At the same time, a lot of our energies and our development goes into people fighting and killing each other. You know, it's the whole thing. If you took something like uh, uh, nuclear energy, it can be used for peace. It could be used for killing a lot of people. But uh, I think things were in desperate shape and there's good reason to be pessimistic. And there are times when I will be pessimistic. At other times, I try to put it into perspective. And uh, I remember the, a good bit of the part of the 20th century, especially I do remember the tail end of the Depression. And I remember World War II. And I remember, you know, Korean War. I remember Vietnam War. And I remember getting drafted. And I remember fighting to try to, uh, you know, knock some sense into Congress to stay out of the Middle East un under under Bush. And I think of all those things. And uh, when I look at now, right now, in, in a short period of time, I say, hmm, you know, we, we don't have thousands of Americans dying. You know, they elected Nixon to stop the war in Vietnam. And after he was elected, 34,000 more Americans were still killed. So th those are problems. We still have a problem, but, you know, in some way, philosophically, I think we're in worse shape because uh, even though we went through those times, uh, we weren't killing each other. We weren't fighting each other. We didn't have uh, the divisiveness that exists today. And uh, right now it's a it's a real mess. Uh, what's happening, you know, in Washington uh, wasn't it wasn't it, it wasn't that bad uh, when I was there. And I felt very comfortable just going my way and taking my position. And uh, when I could uh, socially, I always tried to think uh, I can get more from people if you socialize and talk with people than, than you do fussing with them. So I always uh, uh, thought that, that that was the better way to go. And right now though, I think philosophically we're in bad shape. When you say, well, you know, the government tells us there's not that much inflation going. And I think it's a disaster because I think inflation has a lot to do with what the money supply is doing. And if you look at the if you if, if you look at all the QEs and what's been going on here in this last year and they're planning, they talk about trillions of dollars of new money like it's twelve dollars you know it's just totally insane and yet people have been lulled to sleep and uh, unfortunately civil liberties uh aren't even defended by good liberals anymore you know so, uh, the american civil liberties union essentially doesn't even exist so that's that to me i see i see philosophically us in worse condition yet at the same time you know i i get pessimistic i'll be on my program and i'll say yes you know this internet stuff we can't even begin to guarantee our 
our, our ability to use the internet. At the same time, I said, I'm on the internet, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and they say, well, politics really stink. Well, it depends on how you use it. I went to Washington and I was there a good many years and people said, didn't you really get disgusted? And my answer was, well, I, uh, I had low expectations. I didn't expect, I wasn't expecting to, uh, uh, you know, save the world, but I had a mission. I had a desire. And I remember Hans Senholtz giving me a compliment once that I really enjoyed because he was one of my teachers and he was a student of Mises. He says, whoa, whoa and he talked in his German accent. He says, well, you know what I think it is? He says, I think you're a teacher, you're not a politician. So that to me was a compliment. And uh, for that reason, I was able to, uh, you know, talk to find a liberal, there's nothing more exciting than finding a liberal that would agree with, say, a, a libertarian view on some civil liberty issue or some war issue. So, but I think we're in a tough position. I think it's a philosophic problem we have. I think we still have enough mechanisms. I'm delighted that you're doing, Doug, that you're doing this radio because, uh, you know, you've been one of my favorites. And the more you get out there and you say, well, I'm about time to take a rest. Baloney, we're not going to take a rest. And because the one thing when I talked to the college kids, which I enjoyed the most, I said, look, if, if you believe what I'm saying or even part of it, uh, you, you should have a little fun with it. And that's why going to conventions and things always has been uh, fun. And you should you should have fun doing uh, doing this and, and sending out a message. But uh, I think it's uh, I think it's that that we still have a lot of opportunities. But it's serious business, and it might be one of the most serious in the world. And right now, I do believe the people who are starting talking about, there are people out there that would like to not just destroy the United States and a little bit of your freedoms and we're gonna steal an election here or there. But I do believe uh, there are people who really understand what Western civilization was all about and they would like to dispose of that and turn the world upside down and put, send it on another direction. I think that's the biggest issue of the day. Well, we totally, I, I, Absolutely and totally agree with you, Ron. But you know a lot of congressmen that are still in office. You've been out of office for years, but you still know some of these guys that are hanging around there. If you went back into Congress today, how would you be received? Do you feel that you'd be ostracized by the current people in Congress? I think it would be tougher. I, I thought things went pretty well for me on a personal basis. I'll tell you one story that made me feel better about that I was escaping it. You know, Gingrich was the speaker and he had to get the bills passed. He had the obligations and the big bills, nobody liked voting for him because there was too much, especially, you know, in the Republican conference. But uh, they, uh, they were, were reluctant. And I think, and I, I didn't go to many of these meetings, but this was one meeting I went to, and he was talking to the caucus, Republican caucus. He says, every one of you guys are going to vote for this thing. He says, every one of you guys are getting, they got what you got, what you wanted, and you're going to vote for it, except Ron Paul doesn't have to. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I thought, well, that was pretty neat because uh, to me, that meant he at least respected what I was trying to do. And uh, these other people who wanted to be conservatives and vote against it. And yet at the same time, behind the scenes, he was doing exactly what they all did. So uh, well, how many, uh, how many, how many, how many communists or doctrinaire socialists were there in uh, the house back in the days when you were there? Well, I would say they were, you know, they, they were secret. They weren't as, uh, and that's a bad sign. They're much bolder now to even run as a socialist and uh, they don't call themselves communists. But I would say the individuals that I knew, there, there were probably a, uh, uh, you know, maybe six or eight today. It's many more, but the big difference is, is they're very, very bold. And, uh, and, and uh, right now they say that AOC is the speaker of the house uh, because, but, but you gotta give her credit for something. She actually believes in something. She believes in all this evil, but the other people don't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> they, they, they don't really believe what they're doing other than their pragmatism and taking care of their people. And I argue philosophically, Republicans or Democrats, they're all like, they believe in the Federal Reserve. They believe in intervention overseas. They believe in, in the, uh, you know, the 
debt. They've all been taught that deficits don't matter, and they agree on that. And if they're in the middle of an impeachment process, they will suspend the process so they can go over there and vote to get the bills passed. <laughs> you know, so on the big stuff, uh, they're together. But there's a real honest to goodness fight and it's furious and because the power is getting bigger and bigger. I think the political squabbles are getting much more serious. So I have no idea. I always look on the positive side and I just I just avoided it. I didn't uh, I didn't engage, uh, you know, in and try to convert them. You know, that, that, that was that was not possible. And I and, and I, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you remember Len, uh, Leonard Reed. He was one of my favorites. And uh, he says. Your job is is to do your best to understand the issue and be prepared and answer the question. And he says something will come up. Some people will make use of you. And I often thought about that. So my job was to continue my education, and uh, I, I I did that. But but uh, and instead of the wrong approach is saying I'm going to change you today. You're going to listen to me. I'm going to join the power structure. If you don't do it my way, I'm going to. Issue, which was exactly the wrong thing to do. So this, uh, uh, on a rare occasion, and I do remember him, every once in a while, a member of Congress would come, sit down beside me, and there would be a vote going on, and I'm the only one that's voting one way against the darn stuff, but it was uh, accepted by both parties. And then I would have a member come and very seriously says, uh, why don't you tell me what you're doing? <laughs> you know, why, why are you voting against this? And they and and some of them really was turned around to a degree, uh, but it's, it was so rare for them to even think about it. Oh, the other one is an interesting story, Doug. Is that uh, uh, when I was in the campaign and I was having this relative success, it surprised me to no end that when I went to the campuses, the young people liked the uh, like the the message, and then there was. Uh, you know, the day that they that the, that the grassroots put together, uh, you know, a, a, a fundraising event, uh, the Tea Party movement, sorry, and it was uh, it was spontaneous and the money started pouring in and pouring in. I couldn't understand and nobody else could. And I think we broke all kinds of records and we didn't instigate it. And we raised six million dollars, which was a, a big deal. And I remember going to the floor not too many days after that. And, you know, they were I was getting a little bit of attention. They came over and they, they were congratulations. They were being very polite to me and they wanted to know, what do you do? How did you do that? <laughs> what, what, what was what, what was your method? What was your taking? And even if we did know a little bit about it, I never was too savvy with all the internet and uh, all this other stuff. So I I I didn't really really know. But uh, it it was uh, uh, I and I thought to myself. I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't in a position to you know try to embarrass somebody. And I and while, as I was sitting there looking up. I should have said or could have said, why don't you look up there at the board? Maybe, maybe I'm getting support from the young people because of what I'm doing here philosophically and not politically. And because I happen to believe that, but uh, it, it's, it was subtle and slow uh, looking for influence. I said, I have no desire for political power, zero. I'm not interested in that, but I didn't mind the idea of, of maybe gaining a position where I would have a, a little influence on people's thinking about the concept of liberty. Well, you had a bigger influence than just about anybody in recent times. But, you know, it's interesting that your son, Rand, has kind of picked up the baton. But uh, am I correct in believing that <sighs> Rand tones things down uh, a lot from where you are? He's more conservative as opposed to libertarian. Uh, what's the story? How did he get into this game? Well, that's hard to say, and I'm in a uh, in a habit of not critiquing my son. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, because uh, uh, he he's well informed and he understands it, but he also is a. He, he's a little bit more pragmatic in the sense, but, you know, I'm sort of pragmatic, too, by not offending people, you know, you know, and thinking I can get further along with a soft sell rather than a strong one. But uh, no, I think uh, 
uh, I think his, his approach is different, but his, his, his beliefs are very, very similar to, to mine. And uh, he, he, he loves politicking too, but not in a necessarily a negative. He's not going to go out to, uh, uh, for special interests and things like that. But he, uh, but he, he when, when he was in college, uh, and I was running a tight race in Texas and for Congress. Uh, he, he loved campaigning. He, he, he would take time off and come. And a matter of fact, the biggest political challenge, and I thought the most interesting challenge was I was in, you know, for six years. Uh, no, it was four terms. It was almost uh, eight years. But, but anyway, I went back. I was, it made no sense. I was back, back in the uh, uh, 70s and early 80s. And uh, it, was, it was pretty pretty dull. Uh, this is, this is not my thing because I wasn't, I wasn't looking for political power. Uh, and so, uh, I got out of Congress and I was out for 12 years. I liked medicine. I went back to medicine. Then after that, the mid nineties, I decided, uh, for whatever, whatever reason to go back, uh, and, and try it again. But I, um, uh, I had a, 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 you know, a time there because the Republicans were furious with me. They, they remembered how I voted, so they weren't very anxious. And every, every Republican campaigned against me. This was one time Gingrich came and campaigned against me. So it was, it was uh, uh, pr pretty bad. But uh, I, um, I, you know, got back into Congress, uh, but, but it was never never the the issue you know it wasn't to be i had enough years in there for seniority if i'd have played the ball game and raised the money for the republican i could have been chairman of the banking committee but that did, i had no interest in that whatsoever because matter of fact that was the enemy as far as i was concerned i wanted to get people to think about and this is one place where i thought i had relative success and that is calling attention to the people especially young that money and how that translates into uh, people financing wars and welfareism and special interest to big business and all this. So I think that, uh, and that was considered just a real oddball issue about the Federal Reserve. But I remember the first time I ever ran as a lark in 1974 as a consequence of what was going on, uh, you know, in 1971, when they closed down Bretton Woods, that really, you know, got me excited. So, so I, I, ran, uh, I ran for Congress, but even in that first election, which was zero politically, you know, I looked back, I found a brochure. It, it mentioned gold in there and it mentioned the Federal Reserve in it, but it probably took until the 1980s. And we eventually had a couple votes by the House and a uh, large majority, two thirds of the Congress voted to audit the Fed. All the Republicans supported me and, and I had nothing to offer them. You know, I had no position. I, I had no, uh, nothing, you know, you vote my way, my way, I'll give you something like this. It was none of that. But uh, it, to me, I thought it was a, uh, a success in that I drew attention to it. And still, that's a big issue, as you know, and you, uh, you've contributed so much to it about the stupidity and the ridiculousness of, of what this central banking is doing, because I usually use it to tie in the whole concept of big government and personal liberty. None of this stuff could happen if you didn't have this concept taught in our universities to go along with this and, uh, and, and, and make anybody who talked about, you know, the gold standard. Well, that's stupid, you know, and then they mock you and, and ridicule you. I didn't receive that, but that's the way they do it behind the scenes or anybody else that want, wants to do it. But the, the, fact that, uh, the, the fact that we got those votes, it wasn't a, ref I didn't take any credit in the fact that, you know, I went around and, you know, I talked to these guys and I convinced them. That wasn't it. I went to their constituents. I went to, uh, you know, uh, to, to reach people, to tell them why it was important. They went to their congressmen. So that system was more of a process that was more, you, you know, uh, uh, more respectable. Well, Ron, the, it's, it's pretty obvious that the Democratic Party is, is, is the actual enemy at this point, and the Republicans are worthless. So there's still the Libertarian Party, but I've been saying for years that uh, it's, uh, 
some people that really want to be in politics but can't make it in the big time. So they're swimming around in this little toilet bowl. And the kind of candidates that the Libertarian Party has had recently, like William Weld, talk about a, an ARC oh, member God, of the yeah. state. What do you make of the Libertarian Party? I don't think there's any hope for it. Probably not. You know, uh, I, I technically am a, still a member of the, of the party, mainly because when I ran as a candidate, I was sincere in trying to pass, you know, spread a message. And uh, I joined and I said, I'll be a lifetime member and I paid it in gold. So I'm, I'm, I'm a member, uh, but I don't participate. They have uh, uh, not reached out to me at all. Uh, you'd think maybe they would. Uh, but uh, but well, they're, no, they're I really think not very, they're not very smart, Ron. I mean, yeah. they've had people like uh, who was that congressman from? Was it Georgia named Barr? That oh yeah, the they made him. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no principles at all involved in it. Who are these people in the Libertarian Party? No, no, it's it's not very good because they have room to be really, really strong on the issues, but they don't provide that. Matter of fact, uh, they they dilute our opinion because they they are labeled libertarians, and somebody who might be interested will hear it, and they know they're not going anywhere, so they don't get a real interest in it. But then they say they hear it, so they hear the dilution, the little bit of attention that they get. So it's not good. They should be. Uh, they should be listening to Tom Woods. Tom Woods has spoken out against uh, how, how the Libertarian Party is operating. Uh, and I never, I, I don't like politics. I don't think the party system is worth my effort to think about, but uh, I, I've always used it as just a vehicle. You know, from the very beginning, uh, it was my little foundation. I started in 1976, but the big motivation was the breakdown of the Bretton Woods uh, because I remember the night, the speech, and and I remember uh, uh, you know uh, Nixon getting on a, on the TV on a Sunday night, and the next day I was astounded because I was attending a um, meeting in the Chamber of Commerce and they loved what he said. <laughs> you know, and not only was it dealing with the monetary system, they were putting on tariffs and uh, wage and price controls. And I said, this country's in bad shape. So that's when I decided I think I, I'd at least speak out. So I went where there was a forum uh, when I first, uh, you know, went into Congress or. Uh, we, we just involved, uh, I'd get invited to college campuses. I went and I wanted to talk to people who had an interest because there was a group of people identifying as libertarian. I would go and, and most of the time I always, I'd get a good crowd out. I'd get 10, 12, 15 people to come out, you know, back then. But it turned out that a lot of those people I talked to in the small crowds, I met them again later on when I was in Congress. They came to work for me in the Congress. They came to work for me in the campaigns and they still uh, work and they're still in the, uh, the various organizations that uh, I met when they were young and in college and, and uh, the crowds were very small. But I guess the biggest thing that shocked me was uh, I, just, I just couldn't quite understand it because I was sort of locked in, uh, you know, the limitations of what I was doing. So I was, um, I was in a way pretty amazed uh, about uh, people who turned out. And I'll tell you what, uh, one time I had, I gave a speech at Berkeley and uh, this was in the middle of the campaign where I was getting some national attention. We had 8,000 people come out. Uh, nothing like what Trump did, but 8,000 people for a so-called Republican on, on, uh, on Berkeley campus. That, that excited me and I uh, didn't want it to go to my head, but I felt good about it. But if I felt good because I thought the message is sellable. The people, they will listen to you if, if the message is good. And I've never given myself any significant credit for being, you know, a, a great speaker. You know, I can see my shortcomings when I give a speech, but I believe so strongly in the principles of liberty, the importance of it in a, in a moral sense, in an important thing, in a practical sense, in a political sense, 
for peace and prosperity. I said, so sincerely believe in that, that, uh, and people put up with, you know, my other shortcomings and say, well, he's not a perfect speaker, but I deal with something that I think is one of the best philosophies ever. And that is, you know, I said, I simplify our philosophy too. Uh, you, you know, uh, it, it do, do whatever you want to do as long as you don't hurt anybody. It's no more Listen, complicated two, than that. Two questions that are kind of related that, I, that have occurred to me. Number one, <clears throat> did you get to know Donald Trump uh, very much, number one? Uh, and number two, uh, that movement that he generated where he'd have tens of thousands of people gathering even when he wasn't there, uh, were you involved in that at all? Or do you know many of those people? No, not the speeches. And uh, I essentially don't know Trump. Rand does know Trump. And he, uh, and I think in, in a proper way, I mean, uh, some people might criticize and said, well, he was too friendly with him. But no, he stuck to his guns on his votes and all. So uh, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't know him. Uh, there was a suggestion. I talked to him on the phone and somebody put, put a call into him and he was a real a, a delightful person, a gentleman and very polite to me and uh, absolutely opposite of his public uh, you know, image of Groff and all all this stuff. He was he was just a, a real a real gentleman uh, when, when I talked with him. But uh, no, I uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know who uh, who the people were. I think he was. He just uh, touched on it. But a lot of people say that you know uh, his his uh, his approach was similar, but his views were so different than mine. You know, the, the foreign policy annoyed me. I, I just think of his contribution uh, to modern monetary theory. You know, and the pressure he could put on the Fed <laughs> to to lower the interest. And that was back in the old days when all you had to worry about was QE. You know, yeah, another one, another one. And uh, even the, the four years that he had, uh, and then with the breakout with his virus, everything's going to be solved with money. So that was a that was a real challenge. But he was different. People, were, I think, for me. He symbolized the disgust that the people have, uh, you know, with conventional politics and the Republicans and Democrats, you know, neither one uh, are fulfilling the role. But uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I really didn't get to know him. I, I can remember one time. I don't think I, I don't think I said hello, but we sort of passed on a stage once. And this was at this was at, at CPAC. And I don't know what year that had been. It might have been. Uh, I won it in eight and 16, you know, the straw vote. I know eight and 12. So it might've been 12. He always dabbled in politics and he was a, he was a speaker there. And uh, I, um, I've preceded him. I gave my speech. And of course we invited our friends there and the staff got me a good crowd, you know, and I could, I can talk, you know, the, the purity of our beliefs and the reception was fantastic. And Trump came up and uh, he wasn't the person that I talked to on the telephone who was very, very docile and friendly. And, and uh, he got up and he wasn't unfriendly, but it, it just seemed strange to me. He immediately had to go and blast me a little bit. <laughs> and I don't even know the guy, you know, but he was blasting me. He says, Ron Paul can't go anywhere. And he's all off on this. And, uh, and it was just, it wasn't worth anything, but except to him, that was his personality because he saw that I had attention, I think. Uh, but he learned how to get the attention like nobody else ever did. And, uh, but uh, we always wished we could make more of a libertarian on him, but uh, and we've tried to influence him. But uh, and and uh, no, no Doug, the only thing as bad as he was on some of these politics, you know, there were less a lot less body bags in his four years than there have been under the Democrats. And uh, under this Biden, you can expect more body bags, I think. I think that's true, unfortunately. Don't you think, Ron, that uh, the reason? Well, well, Ron. Sorry, go ahead, Doug. No, yeah. you go ahead, Matt. All right, so I was just gonna say, Ron. I mean, the, you know, your success, where you know the the authentic message, the principled message that really captured people's ideas. I mean, I'm I've only voted for president once, and I didn't even really do vote. I was in Iowa. I caucused for you, though. Uh, <laughs> I, I never never would have imagined doing that before, and and not since. 
but it was the the authentic the, the real principled message and the fact that you it was clear that you were not just pursuing political power and i think that's it's the combination of those two things coming together is if somebody can do that i mean you know maybe there might be a, a reasonable political movement that's still possible but Without those right. two together, it doesn't seem like it'll ever happen, honestly. Well, you know, that's an interesting subject because that's something I, I, I think about it. And uh, after a major speech I gave, and it was a college event, uh, a lot of them would come. The first thing is, I usually talk for an hour. The first 45 minutes, I would be really hardcore. And this place is miserable. You're not going to have any freedom or money. And, you know, and the wars are horrible. The last 15 minutes was, you know what? It's not a big deal. It's not complicated. You, you know, just declare that you own your own life and you don't hurt anybody else, you know? So, uh, but a person came up to me and uh, he was saying that, uh, well, I like what you say because, uh, because you're, you're, you're an optimist. And uh, I, I, uh, I found out that uh, they they want to hear they want to hear optimism. At the same time, they want to hear the truth. And I said, uh, "Oh no!" The, and this was af- I'm sorry. This was after a debate because uh, uh, I remember there were other other people had given a speech, and uh, they they came up and they they liked it because you know I was for this, and they knew I was for the Constitution and freedom and all these things. I said, look, I said, so-and-so just gave his speech and he said, he's for the constitution and he's for the limited government. He did he say something like what I was saying? He says, yes. He says, well, but we don't believe him. <laughs> you know, they said the same words, but, but the young students, they said that he, well, nobody believed what he was saying. And uh, I think that is, that is the difference. If, if I was a can, candidate and had a perfect delivery and perfect words and I read my speech, believe me, I probably would have never gone to Congress. And, uh, y- you know, they, they want spontaneity and they want truth. When I first said, I was in a very busy ma- medical practice in 1971, when uh, Bretton Woods broke down. And I was just determined because I had gotten excited in the late sixties about the monetary issue. I told my wife, I said, Carol, I said, you know what? I'm going to run for Congress, <laughs> you know? And uh, she said, what, what, what would you want to do that for? And I, you know, I explained to her, you know, and she wasn't much into politics and all that business. So I said, I want to just go out and, and, and talk about the, you know, gold standard and, and all these things that are very important to me. And uh, she said, you know, she, she said, that, that, is, that could be dangerous. I said, how can it be dangerous? She says, uh, they're going to believe you and they're going to elect you. <laughs> I said, no, no, they're not going to elect, uh, they're not going to elect uh, somebody that wants to get rid of Santa Claus. But uh, she was she was serious, and I was, you know, not believing any of it could be true. So uh, she was she was correct in assessing that what I was saying would be more believable, and I think that's what the country starves for. And I think that's why, uh, you know, the the true believers have had conferences, and uh, I think that's what attracted me to the Air Society. The people at the Air Society back then didn't know me very well, but I thought that sounded like they were looking for the truth and they wanted to talk about it and they were going to look for it in all nooks and uh, corners and uh, I think that's what people really want I had so many people in my district tell me Ron I don't agree with everything you say and all your positions but he says we know you're telling the truth and we know you're going to do what you say so it was a trust factor that overrode any concern about most of them, Republicans were always concerned that I wouldn't be tough on foreign policy and that uh, therefore they wavered on that. But the thing that brought them together is that uh, there was a trust factor. And right now, the trust factor for the uh, politicians in Washington are probably a lot lower than maybe they've ever been. When you have this total loss of faith in institutions like this, when you have total loss of faith in institutions and politicians and stuff, what's what's the outcome? Like, how do you, how do we come back from that? You know, it just seems like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the fourth turning or, you know, read that book at all, but it just seems like we're at this breakdown where no one trusts anybody and we see everyone is the other. Uh, and so just, how do we get out yeah, of it? 
Well, some people would say that, well, you need more help. Send me help, elect a few more congressmen. And uh, I tell, you know, a lot of young people after I would give a speech, is how do, what do I do? Give me some advice on what I should do to go to Congress and help you out. I said, the first thing you should do is give up on the idea of going to Congress. You know, I, I never wanted to go to Congress just to be, be in Congress. So that, that, is, that isn't it. No, I think, uh, and I told them that even if you get, 10, 20, or 30, it's going to be helpful, you know, uh, a few people listen to me, so you can get some benefits if you're there, you know, for the for the right reason, but uh, it, uh, it, it's something that people uh, have to decide on which way they're they're going to go, and I, I think that uh, uh, they would like to see the people change, but they're sick, they're sick and tired of it is, is what it is, uh, and, and they, 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 they don't know which way to go. But uh, I, I think it's uh, it's something that uh, uh, you, you know that we can we can handle if we know what we believe in, and you have to take advantage of it. But you have to know what people are there. So some of the some of the people, uh, you know, didn't have it together, and I, I don't discourage. I say don't don't run, uh, you know. Uh, but you should be very careful. It isn't a matter of learning how to use the internet to raise a lot of money. Uh, that, that's, that's not the way to go. So Ron, what do you make of what happened uh, on January 6th that impressed me as uh, basically a, a minor disturbance, but the uh, feds are making it into a, a nightmare for the people that they're saying participated in it, number one. And number two, we don't hear anything anymore from uh, the people in the hinterland. I mean, they're, they're quiet. And uh, this, uh, I'm wondering what's going on with these people. And three, uh, is a civil war possible because the uh, red counties and the blue counties appear to really hate each other? <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to be 1861 type of civil war. I think the civil strife is there. I think uh, uh, it's going to get a lot more violent. I think the system will break down. You're not going to uh, uh, get enough people in there to start uh, voting to cut back. Nothing will ever be cut back. Real taxes will never go down. So we're on. A dead end course of, uh, of the total financial uh, collapse. So I don't work with the assumption that I just need a little bit more help and I'll go back in and we're going to save the day. That is not going to happen. And uh, you should be prepared for it and who's going to replace it. But uh, just think of... Uh, just think of this craziness of the, the, the woke movement. The wokeism is pretty amazing on uh, how much how much infiltration are there every place? But it isn't with guns. It's a sort of a philosophic group and who directs them and what happens. But it is, it is philosophic in the way because their goal is to destroy Western civilization. And uh, that, that's why, uh, I don't know, I think uh, January 6th is a big deal. And it's, it, it blends into, uh, see, even with Trump's shortcomings from a libertarian view, Trump is a real enemy of the establishment. And so they, they uh, I think it started all with jealousy. People were jealous of all get out the politician. This guy got to be president and look at him. He didn't, he was so politically incorrect. And, and, and then that jealousy turned into hatred. So everything is hatred. That's why even before he became president, everything was determined to hate Trump, hate Trump. And, uh, and, and, and that, uh, you know, never seemed to happen. But that's what that thing's going on on six. I think it's all canned to blame Trump, you know, for it. If it, if it wasn't, Outwardly so, they grab it to blame Trump. Trump gets blamed for everything. And uh, I think that's going on. But there are some people who are getting awfully angry and awfully upset. Uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of violence. But uh, I, that's why I'm for gun control. I want gun controls and have all the guns taken away from the government, you know, and let people defend themselves because they're going to need to. But uh, where are all the guns? Where are all the big guns killing people all around the world and all this stuff going on? Boy, what was really disgusting to that this recent thing with the with the riots in the streets and property rights didn't exist and they're burning down buildings and they were 
killing people who were supposed to be on their side. Uh, you know, we're supposed to help minorities, so we burned down their businesses. So th this, uh, uh, this to me is un unbelievable how bad that has gotten, and they want to start all over again. I think we will end up needing to start all over again. That's why our effort, your effort, everybody's effort, anybody who really cares, we got to get our message out there to get people converted. Because uh, how did how did they achieve this stuff? Uh, how did every businessman in this country? No, not everyone, but a bunch of the business people, you know, support all this garbage. You know, this whole thing, we're very interesting because there's a plus and minus on what is going on in Georgia right now. They actually give a law that is very helpful to minorities in the state where half the people are blacks. So they say, oh, no, you're this is all racism and we're going to punish Georgia. So we're going to take the baseball game and put it in Colorado where there's very few black people. I mean, the whole thing is nuts. But who puts these things together? So it is a philosophic thing. And uh, that's why the more people that know what liberty is all about, and it's an option that is so much better and so much more peaceful. And my my program and my, my organization is Ron Paul's Institute for Peace and Prosperity, because I really believe that if you want peace, and I do believe people want peace and they want prosperity, and they but they get lulled to sleep and saying the only people that can provide that is the government. But they're taught that from cradle on up to be dependent on government. And we have to erase that from them because as long as they're dependent on government, they're going to say right now, they're waiting for the next nope. trillion dollar bailout, two trillion dollars, yeah, but that's going to end. Oh. And uh, that's why we better be yeah. prepared. And Doug, you've done a lot of work trying to get people prepared, you know, uh, and I, uh, I, I keep working on that and it's ideological. It uh, has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the Republicans and Democrats because they're the ones who have screwed it up. They're the ones who have spent all the money, but they get support from the people. Matter of fact, if you didn't vote for that, uh, except my contradiction would be, I told Carol, I'm, a, I'm voting against Santa Claus. They're not going to listen to me. They're not going to vote for me. So something happened where there was a, a change uh, where they actually did vote for me and and it turned into a positive rather than a negative uh so uh, a lot of some of that's just sort of sort of surprises me i guess right but ron now the bolsheviks are in office and they're not declared bolsheviks but they're exactly the same personality type that the bolsheviks were or the jacobins are the same people in a different time. Now that they have control of the apparatus of the state, I don't think they're going to give it up. Oh. Now, you think that's possible? I mean, I think that the last election uh, was fixed in many ways. It was, there was a lot of cheating going on. And now that they have control of the apparatus of the state, it'll be much easier for them to cheat. So what do you think is gonna happen here based on that? Well, they're going to lose control because eventually the people are going to give up. Today on my program, we talked about uh, the Rangers baseball field. You know, 34, 38,000 people showed up and they were given a choice by our governor. If you don't want to wear a mask, you don't have to. So they didn't wear a mask. 38,000 people there and, uh, and, and and none of them are for, you, you know, the vaccine uh, 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 passport. And, and that's good. But they're still New York. They're still California. But I think I think uh, at the uh, lower level, there's a lot of people who are with us. But uh, we need a lot more people and uh, people people go to baseball games and they go to the beach and they break the law, you know, because they're sick and tired of it all. But we need to encourage people and, and, and encourage them and let them know they're on the, uh, they're on the moral side of justice. And this whole idea that uh, that they that the Fauci is going to listen to them and, and we have to undermine that. So what we're concentrating now on our program is is pointing uh pointing out the hypocrisy our our audience especially but most people most decent people hate demo, uh, you know uh, hypocrisy and when when you can take the governor of california and show him what he's telling everybody else to do and what he's doing personally all of a sudden the people get angry at that so no uh, to me it's still it's still getting a message out and getting people upset so when it breaks down 
I, I do believe that people should be organized. They should know where their friends are. And I think it's going to get very, very bad. I think there's going to be a ring and the whole silver can be helpful in times like this. And, uh, and that, the, that the, uh, the answer to this is not complex. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just saying that I'm not going to ever hurt anybody and, and no lying, no cheating, no stealing, no killing. Wow. You know, uh, that's been around uh, even before the Ten Commandments. And uh, those are principles that have been around and they come and go and and we certainly in our early history had a little bit more respect for that moral standard and uh in spite of all the shortcomings western civilization was built with those shortcomings but right now though those bolsheviks and other their goal is to change that they do not like western civilization but i'm optimistic enough to say that uh if we have more people uh, talking about this message and why it's a good message and you can be better off people vote in their own self-interest if they if you say well uh, if you do this it'll be tough for 20 years but your kids will be okay now they, they got to know right away that they're better off and that they ought to honor and respect and understand why liberty is better and just think of just think of the idea now that the fascists the, the communists and the bolsheviks they never close down which is very important to a lot of americans is going to church <laughs> but but this this mob out there really has has just about ruined so many churches and that just means freedom to to, to have a spiritual uh, you, you know a, a, a spiritual moment uh and now they've accomplished that so that is going to rally people i think i think on the long run the underground will build and that there's every reason for us to uh, to succeed at this, but if we do nothing, it could be it could be bad news for 20, 50 years, and we'll have to go through Venezuela and Zimbabwe and all this. But uh, I, I, the message, I think, Doug, because of so many people for understanding the Austrian School of Economic Policy as it as it is related to liberty, I would think that. Uh, you know, in the last 50 or 60 years, there's been a tremendous increase in that. I never heard of the word when I was in college. And, uh, and, and a lot of people now are barely understanding it. But if they, if they know what that is, they should have a sense of optimism that there is a better way. So I think there's a reason to be concerned. But uh, I think there's also a reason to uh, find your allies uh, identify with them, make your plans, and, uh, and and do what you can to spread a message, which is no, no matter where you are, the message is important for your own satisfaction and for getting by on a daily basis. Well, Ron, you've done more for that cause than anybody that I can think of, with the possible exception of maybe Harry Brown, but uh, Harry's no longer with us. Matt, do you have any other thoughts or questions? Um, you know, I just wanted to get, I, I don't know you don't like to talk about, uh, or you don't talk about as much maybe um, ideas of the moment, but I'm just curious about, as I've never heard your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And I know a lot of our, you know, a lot of our viewers have asked, but I told them you were going <laughs> to ask that question. I'm just, do you think that, just what's your opinion on them? Well, my opinion is, is that uh, I don't understand everything about it. I've not been into computers and uh and how that works uh i understand money pretty well in history and i uh study and read and and work real hard at trying to reconcile the two uh one time i asked uh, bernanke uh, a simple question simple questions that i've ever asked asked i said it's gold money <laughs> and he paused and paused no, it's not money. Well, uh, that's not so easy uh, on, on crypto because my position is, is twofold. One is a political position. And uh, this is the political position that I have is that that is why I'm friendly with people who are super interested in crypto. I don't invest in crypto. I don't understand a lot about it. I don't know where it's going to go. I worry about it. But my position is obviously freedom of choice but no fraud and use it if it works and it's a good filler because in theory on paper this looks pretty good but there are some things there that just doesn't match up with gold <laughs> you know so uh but the important thing is that you have your freedom 
uh, to do it and to substitute them because if the world rejects the dollar uh, right now, I think they're going to uh, use it a lot less. I don't, I don't think that I'll see the day when all of a sudden there are no more dollars. You know, uh, we still have pounds and they had to go through a time when they were a world currency. So the dollar is going to be round. But this is, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we have to, have to deal with. But I, I want to, crypto to be legal. Uh, I worry that they're too flexible uh, because they say uh, it's anonymous and transparent. And that, to me, confuses me. Real anonymous means nobody knows anything that's going on. Nobody. And right. if it's really transparent, everybody knows what's going on. So when I had the chance of people who deal with that, I tell them, be careful. Don't go. Don't try and think you can outfox the regulators because some of them have some of them will have lobbyists there to try to get FEC. I thought, why should we? Why should we uh, be helpful in writing up the regulations for the uh, SEC and uh, the IRS? Uh, so uh, it's 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 difficult, but I still want it to be free and. Uh, uh, because ultimately, whether it's gold or whether it's crypto or anything, the only issue that matters is uh, will be our liberties. Because <clears throat> they, if you say, oh, I'm a gold standard person, it's much better than crypto. Yeah, what did Roosevelt do? With a stroke of the pen, he called all the gold in. You know, and there was no gold there. In this go around, the gold is going to be a lot more important. They had actual deflation in the 30s. Now there's going to always be inflation. So gold is going to be import, more important. And they're going to have some trouble doing it. That, to me, calling in all the gold would be like calling in all the guns. So that may that means maybe there will be uh, a civil strife turn in this, a real civil strife. So that, uh, that's the important thing. So people with crypto, believe me, I have less confidence that uh, right now the people who really understand crypto a lot better than I do uh, should be uh, complacent. Uh, that I, I don't think is uh, it's worthwhile being complacent. But right now, uh, my concerns have, uh, if, I, if, if my talk say, keep it legal, but do what you want, uh, the people who said, oh, no, Ron's, he's too cautious, too cautious, and they bought it when it was $1,000, you know, they say, what a jerk. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm in the business of uh, trying to uh, preserve a free society uh, rather than trying to figure out what is the government going to do with gold this next go around, and what's the government going to do with crypto? I uh, read a couple of stories. Every once in a while I hear that uh, the IRS in, invaded and got hold of one of the uh, dealerships, uh, the exchanges, and they ended up with, they had some names of some people. Well, that, that makes me a little bit nervous. And if you have a question or two more, I'm going to have to go in a little bit here. Yeah, I know, I know you do. Uh, just one last question for you. Um, what is, you know, obviously for Doug and people like you who, are, who talk about liberty and talk about you know, what people, spreading the message essentially, um, it's clear what what you guys should be doing, but what is like the average person in America? What's, do you have any specific ideas about what they should be doing to prepare for what's the changes that are coming in the world? I think the first thing is the advice that I got from Leonard Reed, study, learn, and understand what liberty is and what the history of it is and, and what the scoundrels might do. So, you, and, and learn how to answer the questions. Uh, you, they'll come, you mean there would be no food stamps? How are the people going to eat? You know, you have to be able to handle that to defend it. And then you uh, have a full understanding. Uh, and then it depends on what your job is. Uh, you know, you might be a teacher. You might be a writer. You might be, you know, who knows what. You can always participate. And maybe you even have a family. <laughs> yeah, I have a family and, and I do my best to introduce them to these ideas. So uh, everybody has a different job. Uh, I would, sometimes people want me, to pin, they, they pin me down and I say, okay, now I believe what you're telling me. What should I do? My answer is simple. Do whatever you want. <laughs> just, right. just so you know what you're doing, what you believe in, and who knows what lies before you. I, have, <clears throat> I did what I wanted, but I had never dreamed that uh, I would end up uh, you know, at Berkeley campus. Uh, I thought, what are these people doing here? You know, so it, it was a surprise myself. So everybody can make a surprise. Some people are capable of writing and the internet uh, is very creative. There's, there's been, I see 
people out on the internet now. And I said, oh, I've met him. And they'll even give me credit. They got influenced by when they went to hear me speak. And all. so you, everybody can do that on a different level. And who knows what will come of it. So uh, Doug has reached an awful lot of people. Matter of fact, I've read Doug for a long, long time. Long, long before, then I, before I ran to Congress. I, went into, I even went to his Air Society meeting because I knew he was a good guy. Ron, you're a hero, uh, and I'm only one of many, many millions of people that uh, think that. So uh, you know, we really wish you well, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, thanks. very good. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. It was a real honor to have you on the show. Very, very nice much. being with both of you. All right, great. Truly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron.